Hello, I'm Ben Tuman, and welcome to Skipped History. I'm recording this video after the election, so still no spoilers. This week's story is about the 1964 New York City school boycott. I read about it in a few articles, as well as heard about it in the podcast Nice White Parents. Before we get to the boycott, let's look at the connection between school segregation and redlining a discriminatory housing policy in place from the 1930s to the late 1960s. Through redlining, neighborhoods with more than 5% people of color received C or D ratings from the Federal Housing Administration. These ratings meant that the people in those neighborhoods couldn't get loans to update their property, which led to deteriorating conditions. In turn, that incentivized white homeowners and landlords to keep people of color out of their neighborhoods, lest they get bad ratings too, which then widened school segregation and worsened the conditions in minority majority schools. It was a nasty process. And for context, the only thing that's made more New Yorkers miserable for avoidable reasons is the Knicks. The entrenchment of redlining is one reason that Brown v. Board of Education, the 1954 Supreme Court decision, only kind of struck down segregated schools. In fact, as Milton A. Galamison, a reverend in Brooklyn noted in a letter to New York City parents in 1964, despite the 1954 Supreme Court decision, there are more segregated schools in New York City today than there were 10 years ago. By then, overcrowding was so bad that the school's superintendent, William Jansen, who said segregation wasn't his problem, implemented part-time days in schools attended by black and Puerto Rican students with half of the students attending for the first half of the day and the other half of students attending for the second half of the day. As we saw last week, the inequities also extended to white-centric curricula, leading Reverend Galamis into demand that we must have the Negro's contribution to history properly presented in textbooks. Surprisingly, he didn't do what most New Yorkers do when we see a problem. Instead, he planned a boycott for February 3rd, 1964, to be called Freedom Day. Now, given how pervasive segregation was and how bad the conditions in minority-majority schools were, one school cited in Nice White Parents had two barely functioning bathrooms for 6,500 students. A boycott to send a message that enough was enough seemed reasonable. But if you were reading the New York Times, you might disagree. Leading up to the boycott, an editorial creatively titled No More School Boycotts framed the planned protest as tragically misguided and portrayed all boycotts as pointless, dangerous, and destructive, which, yes, double as the nicknames for Donald Trump's soon-to-be-imprisoned children. Fingers crossed. The Times also criticized Glamison and said that, for the foreseeable future, many schools will remain predominantly non-white simply because there is no realistic way to alter the balance. A statement that sounds a lot like the reason why I couldn't get a B in 10th grade chemistry. It would have required trying. Despite the newspaper's opposition, on February 3rd, 464,361 students and teachers participated in the boycott, making it the largest protest of the civil rights era by far. Almost half of the city's students didn't show up to school that day. How did they spend their time? Well, sure, there were reports of lines at some of the movie houses around the city, who wouldn't want to see 1964 classics with titles that leave nothing to the imagination like the incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies. But almost 100,000 students attended 400 freedom schools set up in community centers around the city. There, boycotting teachers taught them about the history of slavery, discussed why they were protesting, and sang freedom songs like We Shall Overcome, which sounds like a pretty productive day. Unless you're reading the New York Times, while grudgingly conceding that the misguided boycott was a success for its proponents, reporter McCandlish Phillips, who moonlighted as a copywriter for the Yankee Candlish McCompany, asserted that most thought the boycott was not very useful and quoted Dr. John H. Fisher, then president of Columbia University's Teachers College, as saying the boycott was a mistake from the beginning. Many liberals shared that sentiment, including influential rabbi Max Schenck, whom McCandless quoted as saying, black people have been waiting now for a hundred years, and now we're asking them to wait a little longer. Shank got his wish. The boycott failed to inspire the Board of Education to take meaningful steps to diversify the city's schools. And today, segregation both in neighborhoods and in schools is just as bad. 
According to a report from 2019, the city still has policies that perpetuate residential segregation and allow integration less. And according to a report by the UCLA Civil Rights Project, New York now has the most segregated schools in the country. And things don't seem to be changing anytime soon. Last year, when New York Mayor Bill de Blasio was asked by an 11th grader on a call and radio show why he hadn't taken more forceful steps to integrate the city schools, he replied, with all due respect, there is a task force, an extraordinary task force that's coming out with their next report in a matter of weeks. A statement that sounds like Max Schenck telling people to wait just a little bit longer. And like William Jansen saying, not my problem. And like why I couldn't get a C in chemistry. It would have required trying at all. So as we're beginning to see, maybe liberals in New York haven't been so great at addressing racism in America. In our season finale, we'll look at one of the most damaging New York liberals of all a guy by the name of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Tune in next time to learn more about that bit of skipped history.